I was working in UK trade investment on the Africa desk. And so often it was my job to go around to all these investment summits, you know, Zambia, Sudan, Somalia, and they always say, Somalia is open for business. Sudan is open for business. And that was just a saying. One year later, we're still waiting. So a lot of you will come to these events quite skeptical. We're going to try and be open and, uh, you know, we're going to we'll have a great conversation. Um, could I just ask each of you, from, starting from Yofi, just to tell me about GIPC very briefly, but more about where you sit in the investment cycle so we can understand where each, each, member, each member sits. Thank you very much. It's good to be here again. Um, GIPC, um, okay, let me go back. I mean, and <clears throat> the new government in Ghana started um, in 2017, um, right after the 2016 elections. And clearly, um, the feeling was that the economy had to take a new direction from the old. Um, we inherited an economy that in itself wasn't, um, to, for want of a better word, it was in a bit of a, a pickle, um, challenging times. So, of course, what was important, first of all, was to bring about macroeconomic stability through fiscal consolidation and all that. But then, clearly, the, the dream and the vision of the president was to see a very well-developed Ghana that was generating jobs and wealth for its people. So, um, on the back of the repair of the economy, there was also the desire and the urge to grow the economy in a certain direction. And so, as things got in this side developing, we got bolder and bolder, and we realized that um, the need of, for investments was critical because at the time the government took over, um, there was a strong fiscal deficit, um, you know, a strong, strong fiscal deficit, 9%, and obviously government didn't have enough money to undertake any project. Yes. Indeed, at the time of taking over, um, just three items in government's expenditure list took over 107% of all our revenues. Say that, can you just say that again? That was pretty powerful. Yes, <laughs> just three expenditure items on government's P&L took 107% of our revenues. Wow. And that was salaries, payment on loans, there's statutory payments to some of the institutions like uh, Get Fund, ATC, ETC. So, of course, I mean, that needed a, a quick look, review of all that. So, first of all, what government did was to cap its, um, you know, um, contributions to the statutory funds at 25%. So, you couldn't do any more than 25%. And then, of, co of course, also looked at reviewing the loan book and becoming more prudent and managing our debt. And then, the bigger one was... Um, salaries for public servants, etc., because they needed to work, and recognizing that they even didn't get a, a real good wage. So that needed a bit of management. So it was obvious that government needed to go out to ratchet up the you know, desire or the attractiveness of the country to attract investors to enable us develop the infrastructure to the way we want. And so, you know, um, it also meant that a new way of looking at the economy um, and creating an openness um, through reforms. So all that started at the same time. But we also recognize that Ghana, because it's resource rich, has always attracted um, resource seeking FDI, either into mining or into looking at all that. And um, as we repositioned ourselves and uh, we became an oil and gas country, then we had major investors looking at the oil and gas, you know. So, so specifically, GIPC's role in the investment cycle is, is to do what? We are there to attract, mobilize, facilitate, um, invite um, foreign direct investment and also partner it with indigenous or uh, domestic direct investment. And, and secondly, yes. we are also there to lead a reform into uh, making Ghana the best place to do business and uh, improving the investment climate. And then thirdly, to also work with the president on policy. So we report directly to the president. And are the last two bits new? Have they been added to GIPC's, P, GIPC's portfolio? Well, largely, or? yes. Okay. okay, that's good to know. Largely. Just want to go to Lawrence. Um, Exim Bank, 
Ghana. I, I, to be honest, I hadn't heard that it was up and running, and I was doing research, and I was like, wow, this is really amazing stuff. Can you just tell me, when it comes to investment, which bit do you sit in, so people can start to draw parallels? Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, Ghana, as bank, happens to be the freshest, the newest export and import bank. It's just been around for the past two years. The Act 2016, Act 911, came to being in March 2016. And then the previous government lost power, and then I got appointed in March 2017. So I've been around primarily just for about 18 months. The mandate is simple. It's for us to support direct and indirectly trade between Ghana and other countries. That's why I'm here. The second is also supposed to build Ghana's capacity and competitiveness in the marketplace. For which reason, the 1D1F, as has been articulated by the president, the industrial transformation of Ghana sits and rests largely with Ghana Exxon Bank. What have we done so far? We as Ghanaians, we, if we want to talk about Ghana beyond aid, and to become an export-led economy, it means Ghanaians must take the bold mantle in starting in implementing some of the things in Ghana. So Ghanaians must eat, Ghanaians must grow Ghanaian food, and for which reason, we have listed almost about 10 focus areas. You heard Yofi talking about pharmaceuticals, that there's a huge opportunity He's asking investors from Britain to come to Ghana. We have already, as an export and import bank, invested $40 million into the economy, approved and dispersed. What is seek to do is that by 2020, the pharmaceutical industries must have a general manufacturing certificate by World Bank. And to make Ghana as a hub, as articulated by Yofi, requires that strategically we need to position ourselves. And once we do that, it's two things. We are taking over the West Africa sub-region, which has 300 million population size. The whole Africa has 1.2 billion population size. So Ghana wants to leverage on its multi industry, and we are importing equipment, that's the import side of the ex. So we want to have technological transfer from Germany, from UK, from Italy to make sure that either it's vaccines or it's tablets, we get it produced in Ghana and then we will then have the economic of skill to be able to export to the neighboring countries. Three key issues. One, to create employment. Two, value addition. Three is also the foreign exchange so that we will have at least trade deficit will be closed and we will have export to take over imports. I also have questions for you as well, but I just want to make that link to Clarence, because um, Clarence, can you talk about Invest in Africa in Ghana, and again, how you are involved in the investment conversation? All right, so firstly, Invest in Africa is a not-for-profit initiative, and uh, we work with a, a cross-sector representation or network of, of partners. As a matter of fact, looking around, I feel like I'm almost at a board meeting of Invest in Africa <laughs> because we have the honor of having AV and David uh, and GIPC on our board as well. And uh, so, as I said, we work together across sectors to, to, to do two main things. Uh, number one is basically to connect foreign companies or investors to credible local suppliers. And number two is basically to build the, you know, improve the access, improve access to skills, markets, and finance of these SMEs in order to build your long-term capacity. So really, that's, that's what we do. And I have to say, over the last four years, we've done a pretty good job. Uh, cumulatively, we've been able to provide $150 million worth of contracts to Ghanaian SMEs, and also been able to facilitate credit support of about $1 million, again, to Ghanaian SMEs. And then tapping into the, the knowledge and resources available to us on our board, we've also been able to improve the comp competitiveness and manage to train over 200 SMEs 
uh, on a variety of things, whether it's corporate governance, whether it's about standards, whether it's about uh, you know, putting yourself in a good place to access credit. We've done all of that thanks to the support of our partners. And importantly, because we're also into local content solutions, we follow the money to make sure that whatever is being done benefits the Ghanaian. So of the $150 million that, uh, you know, of contracts that have been won by SMEs, over 70% of this money has been retained in country, whether it's household income, whether it's taxes, savings, all of that in, in country. And then also, we're able to also track how many jobs are being supported through these contracts. And I'm happy to say over the period as well, we've done about 30,000 uh, jobs by way of uh, the, our contribution to the socioeconomic agenda. Thank you. And David, I know you're, you're a lawyer. Uh, one of the biggest firms in Ghana, and I know you're, you're very much instrumental in the local content drafting as well. Um, but where, where do you fit in, in, the, in the investment cycle? Is it upstream, downstream, in the middle, or, or, or the whole pipeline? Okay, so, um, a number of areas. It's, it's very difficult to, to fix it where, 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 we, where we fit. Uh, to begin with, as a firm, uh, we simply operate on two basic concepts. Uh, one being that we are a business and projects law firm for Africa, and, and remember the Africa. Uh, and second, because we believe in one continent, one law firm. We, we see investors as looking at Africa and not just Ghana. I happen to be a Ghanaian and based at the headquarters in Ghana, but, but we are an African firm. So where we sit, a number of areas, and there are about four key categories of people that we work with. So first is the private sector. And before the private sector will invest, it's likely to talk to us. Uh, so our clients will talk to us, why do I invest here? What are the challenges I need to overcome, etc. When they start investing, they talk to us, how do I do the investments I've agreed to invest? Uh, how are the nitty gritties to be overcome? So you have to go and talk to GIPC, UOF, or talk to <coughs> uh, 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 Invest in Africa for them to help lobby, create a platform, or go to uh, Exim Bank to help look for funding for exports, etc. So we deal with a number of people even during the process of the investment. Where they face disputes, we may go to court. Uh, and then, I mean, challenge the government if we have to challenge uh, the government or challenge the other party. Uh, at times we come to dispute in UK, we've just won about two or so disputes uh, here, including one in the oil and gas sector. So in disputes, yes, we are still with the investor. Where the investor feels like abandoning the country and want to leave, we are still there. So we are at the full chain with the investor at all points in time. But that's just one for the private sector. But we do work with governments as well. At times, help, helping the government understand the private sector better or putting legislations in place to help the private sector be able to invest. So for example, we've helped the government recently put together a new bauxite law, or the aluminum uh, uh, law, which comes with a number of incentives to enable people to invest in the bauxite to aluminum value chain. So those are specialized areas that you can only help government put together if you understand how businesses work and how the systems work. And there are a number of them that <coughs> we've helped put together. And then if I leave this, uh, we're talking about working with banks, financial institutions, DFIs, etc., either in lending, or borrowing, or helping them understand the framework. And then, of course, we work across 24 countries in Africa, nine cities which are our own operations, and the rest which are best friend networks. So everywhere in the investment cycle, we are there. I'll ask you the first question then. Um, and please be honest, uh, you've talked about, <laughs> I know you're a Ghanaian, you could take the Ghanaian hat off, but put the African hat on. Um, you said you've got a number of law firms around Africa. Is Ghana really one of the simplest countries to do business, in your opinion? Um, but please be honest, I don't want the Ghanaian answer. Lawyers are honest, contrary yes. to what. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ghana is. If you take uh, uh, South Africa, Morocco, let me put the whole of North Africa aside. So South Africa, Kenya, uh, and I will still include Morocco because Morocco is trying to become a West African country. You may not. Yes, I mean, yes. yeah. Uh, if you take these countries and increasingly Ethiopia, Ghana is really one of the most attractive destinations. So, yes, and there are for se several reasons why. We are stable. Uh, at times when we talk about stability, we tend to restrict it to political stability, but I see stability from a different point of view. Of course, we haven't had a coup in Ghana since 1981, so we have about 40 years of stability. 
And at times, we tend to restrict it only to 92. Ghana has been stable since 1981. That's the truth. So political stability, I take that for granted. Nobody looks at that anymore. They take it for granted. The other things we need to be focusing on, which they look at, is whether or not our legal sector is stable. Do the laws change, to use a Ghanaian term, by heart? <laughs> Are you working on a project today and the government changes the law the next day? So at times, some of the things uh, uh, that we do in passing laws, we ought to be careful because those are the real things when investors talk to me, they look at. The other one is financial stability. And I'll tell you, maybe you has not considered this, but that's one of the mistakes we should never repeat. The, the 14th February 2015 letter of the former governor of Bank of Ghana is the worst thing we ever had since 1982, when under the Jerry uh, Rawlings regime, we were, we were summoning people who have more than 20 CDs to go for vetting. After restoring the financial stability, one letter from a governor which simply changed the exchange rules, really, for me, was the worst economic decision we ever took. So when investors are investing, they want to be sure that they can repatriate their money if they have to. They don't want to see a letter tomorrow from a, government, a, a governor who says that you can no more have access to foreign currency. So what that happens is that in the absence of financial stability, people then get confused. Should I invest? Should I not invest? So financial stability is very important. Cost of capital. In fact, cost of capital and access to capital are the two most important yes. concerns of investors, both local and foreign. And at times, we underrate the fact that local investors are themselves an attraction to foreign investors. Now, where you cannot borrow money within the jurisdiction, you will see that a large amount of investments are coming from the stanchas of this world, the JP Morgans, the city banks, etc., coming onshore. But the income they receive is in local currency, which then they have to export, yes. which explains why there is pressure on the city among other things. So the ability to stabilize and improve our financial sector, which is why I support what the Bank of Ghana is doing now, is itself a very significant aspect of the investment drive. And that's part of the stability we need to look at. The last thing I want to talk about are social services. And that's why Ghana becomes attractive. 35% of all top universities in Ghana consist of non ghanaians Suddenly, say, say, say yes, 35%. Again. Say, I know that. Say that again. 35% University of Ghana, KNUST, KVAS, Central University, etc., are non ghanaians Now, there is a significant reason for that. Because education in Ghana is stable, unlike some of our neighboring countries, I don't want to mention their names, where universities are shut down every day. So when universities are shut down, it affects investments. Now, this, this is a very significant thing. Suddenly, UK universities are doing roadshows in Ghana every day, building local universities. New York University has a center in Ghana, etc. Don't take this for granted. If you, what we need to do is to leverage these things. So if I'm investing in Ghana and my children can go to good schools, it's an attraction for my investment. At times, people make investment decisions because their wives want to live there or their husbands want to live there. And therefore, if there are good hospitals, and I know that Ghanaian doctors are good that can go to hospital, it's a more important decision for the investment than all the PowerPoints we may present. So these are very key things investors talk to me about on a daily basis that our decision makers ought to look at and look at how we will bring this to the fore when we are talking to investors. Um, th thank you. <laughs> I, think, I, I think David should be a politician. <laughs> Uh, there's a very honest answer. Thank you for, for being honest. Um, Yofi, I wanted to ask you a question because I said I've been to a number of conferences and they will say they have bankable projects. And when you look at the bankable project book, there's a picture <laughs> and a product saying, Shea Butter, invest. Like, that is not bankable. How bankable is bankable? And can people come to you and see, for example, feasibility studies of, of let's say you want to do a Shea Butter process, processing plant, the um, quantity you can get, the people already working in that area, um, potential off-takers. How much detail is there on bankable projects? Uh, I, I, I would not say there isn't enough information. There could be a lot more. Um, the, the problem, the, in fact, not the problem, the reason being that I think that um, this is my first time in government. I've always been a private sector investment banker. Um, but this time around, I am convinced um, of what the agenda is because you have a government that is clearly committed to executing some of these projects. Now, these projects are being executed because they will bring about the virtual welfare of people, um, whether it's Ghana Beyond Aid or just the investment platform. So when we talk of a bankable project in Ghana, 
we are probably looking at something the government may have decided upon and says we need to get done. Because it's either going to create jobs or it's going to increase the revenue for Ministry of Finance and all that. So that's the way we look at it. Um, not just because um, I'm an investment banker, so okay, I look at the numbers. What is the IR? What is the NPV? Then it's bankable. No. We also look at projects that fit into the outcomes of the SDGs, like I mentioned, the Sustainable Development Goals. So you're looking at projects in health, education, um, fintech, uh, that bring about improvement in welfare and people's social lives, um, like you said. Um, there are, I mean, I, I, I was amazed. I, I was knocked off my feet when I was told that there were almost close to 60 private universities in Ghana. Yeah. And people are investing in education um, because they think it's good because Ghana seems to have focused on education as the basic foundation of uh, building the economy or Ghana be without, without aid. So that's the way we look at the bankable projects. Apart from that, there are also unsolicited bids by investors who see opportunity. You know, uh, we've never had a metro. We've never had a train, a uh, real metro in Accra. But we've had at least six proposals from investors who want to do a metro with us. I think that, well, yeah, it's a great opportunity. We see Accra developing, so let's go do this. Um, and it's been integrated into the Accra Marina project, which is um, a 240 acre development on the beachfront development in Accra, which the government also believes is important to actually change the face of the city because Accra looks congested on a daily basis. The population may rise to close to 5 million. Um, and so a lot of social services are under pressure. Um, so you need to redeveloping the city. Um, you need a lot of regeneration, gentrification in some parts and all that. And these are projects that obviously uh, will be bankable because government lends its support to it because it serves another function other than financial viability or economic viability. The economic viability is measured in so many different things. How is it going to improve the lives of people? How is it going to change the face of the city? Um, those are important. You want to invest in power because power is critical to developing the new economy of industrialization. Um, so you look at it and then it's not just a project, but you look at it and say, okay, so you want to do solar. Now, what will be off ticker price? Is it close to um, 9 cents or is it close to 20 cents? If it's close to 9 cents, it makes sense. If it's close to 20 cents, it doesn't make sense because we need to bring the weighted average cost of uh, delivery of power down. So that's the way we look at it. And, and um, I'm now beginning to uh, appreciate much more the way governments work, um, even from my background as an investment banker. Um, and I realize that the, because of the broader mandates of government, um, viability has many constructs that you need to take care of. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Lawrence, I want to come to you because um, I said I just came back from Ghana and there um, I ate a lot of coconuts and there were 40p. <laughs> I came back to London to Martha Spencer, coconut, four pounds. Five pounds. Five pounds. And the one in Ghana is sweeter than the one I tasted here. And it really frustrates me how you can have such great produce in Ghana. That's why when people go to Ghana, they get fat because they just eat. Because when they come back, they know they're going to be starved. You know, it's very frustrating to see such great agricultural products being grown, literally, some people's back gardens, and then through cooperatives. But yet, they're not being sold in the UK. When you ask them, they say, you know, we don't have, we, we, we might have a contract, but we don't have the, the money or support to get it to the country or to even export it or, get, or to get the capital. You know, Exim, export and importation. How are you able, is your, is your bank designed to, be, to, to support some of the smaller cooperatives that actually could do even better work, you know, by marketing Ghana's produce and actually creating local jobs more? Okay, um, thank you very much. The real essence of establishing Exim Bank was on two fronts. One, access to market for the SMEs and also long-term financing. Okay. For this reason, the example that, that you just proposed, coconut. Coconut is part of our focus areas in Exim Bank. We have put in money for the production. The government's 10-point agenda talked about raw material base. 
We are here talking because we think that we need to develop the raw material base. For instance, blue skies are in Ghana, pineapple processing. Exim Bank has undertaken with other government agencies like Ghana Export Promotion Authority, the Food and Drugs Board, the Standard Board Authority, to make sure that when it comes to certification, when it comes to standards, and also we are supposed to be the key financial institution to support exports. So we are supporting exports. We have provided money for the coconut production. As we speak, and the question you, you also asked, five pound, coconut because of its health benefits. Yes. Now coconut oil sells, is, is a cash cow. And for us at Exxon, we think that as the government wants to diversify its export portfolio, because the talk has always been on gold, timber, now oil. And that's why we are encouraging people to come to the productive sector of the economy, manufacturing, agro-processing. And UK has a lot in terms of the beverage or the food yes. processing area. So whereas others are talking about infrastructure, where there is a huge gap, we also think that the focus now should be on the manufacturing and agro-processing. And for which reason, the technologies that we have outside Ghana has that opportunity and that potential for us to be able to share butter. Another health for hair, for cooking, and Exim Bank just last week with Share Alliance organized a capacity building for Roshu and for FES. And we are investing into it. We've already given $10 million in the share butter industry. Because the share plants in northern region, we don't grow. They just fall. <laughs> All you need is warehousing and also processing it. And there's a huge opportunity in our market. Another one that you have also talked about, textile. Yes. With Agua, now it's duty-free, tariff-free. And Exim Bank is also supporting the garment industry. Nora Barman is here, sleek. I'm sure she'll be speaking. And these are the non-traditional areas that we are diversified, apart from oil, apart from gold, apart from timber. Ghana is, in, is looking up on all these chain areas. So you're talking about pharmaceuticals, garment, cassava, the pineapple, shea butter, all those ones, when you bring it to us, from the SME to the up market. When Bayfi was talking about the industrial parks. Yes, Exim Bank bought the land for free zone. And I've asked him, if he gets any JV, Exim Bank will support any Ghanaian who wants to partner in building that particular industrial park. So we are there to support Ghanaians who wants to partner, and if their job will translate into exports, we will be financing those people. Thank you. Thank you. And Clarence, What's very interesting, I see, that a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of companies want to go to Ghana by themselves, or they want to be in their silo, I mean, food and beverage, and I'll stay there. But actually, they, they haven't really thought about cooperation, collaboration. Um, in your experience, you were 15 years in Unilever, you work at Invest in Africa. How much of, of opportunity is collaboration and cooperation to actually tackle the challenges, but also actually try and get market share as well? You realize quickly the sort of things I was talking about, the access to capital, you know, um, how easily accessible and what's the cost of it and the other issues you raised are really sector agnostic you know these are issues that cut across sectors so in a way um, I think when you realize that these are common issues sometimes it makes more sense rather than going it alone to try to collaborate partner with others so you can address some of these issues in a way that you probably would not have been able to because trying to do it alone can be more expensive sometimes the issues are even more complex as well but by pulling resources together, I think one is, one is able to um, achieve more, you know, get some more efficiency in it and actually get a bigger impact. And I think if you look at the IIM model, that's really what it is at its core. There is, there is no way uh, we could have done what we are doing alone on, on the kind of budget that I have. It's through the partnerships um, with David. David, for example, uh, David's team 
is actually training about 150 SMEs, okay? These are our SMEs that we are trying to build to plug into the supply chain of multinationals and foreign investors. David's team is training them on the importance of corporate governance as well as joint ventures to help them sort of start considering partnerships instead of this mindset of always trying to do things alone. Now that's been done and I'm sure if you were to, you know, to price this, I wouldn't possibly be able to pay that. But it's because of the partnerships. That's when it comes in. So for foreign investors coming in, I would encourage you as much as possible to look at opportunities for partnerships, um, especially in, in, in areas where we are we're trying to um, upgrade or step up the capacity and quality of um, you know, local suppliers and indigenous uh, groups. Um, because actually, it, it's, in the end, it's much cheaper than trying to go in alone. We've talked about Ghana being a gateway to Africa, you know, a soft landing. Uh, before you do business in the rest of the rest of the continent, and um, Ghana was one of the first, I think, it was made with Kenya to ratify uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is which is, I think, one of Kwame Nkrumah's dreams. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, both David and Yufi to talk about how is Ghana position itself to enter that market. Number one. And number two, and actually I want you two to talk about this, how can companies best either partner with a local Ghanaian company and then exploit other African markets, either in ECOWAS but also as, as a continent as well? So I'll start with Yufi and, and, and David, then we can go into the second part of the question. Maybe I should say, strategically, um, Ghana recognizes where Africa is going. And I mentioned this morning that by 2050, um, West Africa alone, the population of West Africa will be 500 million. The population of Africa will be topping 1.8 billion, and it will be the, the fourth largest, actually to be one quarter of the world's population, and still have a demography of 60% of the population less than 35 years old. That is definitely a market waiting to happen. Now, in West Africa, like I said, the, the positioning of Ghana is that, well, we are in the center of West Africa. Um, we have been able to get um, a good semblance of macroeconomic stability. We have been able to grow our economy that we are the fastest growing economy in the world. Um, we, we definitely embrace the idea of regionalization because we believe that intra-Africa trade is important. I mean, if you look at currently, intra-Africa trade is not more than 16%. But if you look at trade with the EU, it's about 65%. That is not... I mean, it just doesn't seem right. When you have a certain population waiting, that's the African continent waiting, to trade within ourselves. Um, and I did say that Africa itself is resource rich. It also has the land. Um, so what are we waiting for? We need to take advantage of that. And I think Ghana in West Africa being, um, having the stability that David talks about, having those soft benefits or soft opportunities or soft assets, that we can leverage on is very well positioned to be the hub. Um, like you said, I mean, the universities in Ghana had to cap acceptance of foreign students because if it didn't, it wouldn't be 35. It easily would have been 50 percent. But the government also had the mandates to educate its people. So you know, we have all these opportunities in Ghana just staring at us. And when I said this morning that my difficulty was talking about what the opportunities is because we take all the boxes and more. It's a reality. And we do have that window of opportunity to leverage that to really bring about development in the continent. Um, I have been to conferences with the president where there's been tacit agreement with some of the regional leaders to spearhead regionalization. I was in South Africa with the president and Cyril Ramaphosa was very clear that Ghana should work with South Africa to bring about economic and financial integration. I was in I was in Mal um, Mauritius with the vice president, and it was the same. And I know very well our president is constantly traveling around West Africa, trying to get them to understand the need to work together to advance our you know, economic causes and, um, and benefits. So Ghana is really um, aggressively pursuing that. David, just to be a bit more specific, what are, the, what are the challenges that investors need to be considerate about before making that, 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 that move? Let me first explain what the CFTA is, and I'll explain who is already taking advantage and then what we can do. 
So you are talking about a potential $3.4 trillion economy for Africa by 2063. That's the estimate. And by 2063, if that economy is actually operational, it will be the second biggest collective group of trading block in the world, other than the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade Block, in terms of volume of goods to be traded. That's what we are talking about. Now, there are three components of it which are important. Forget about the declaration. There's a single air market, which is already being implemented. It's based in Senegal. Almost the people running it are Ghanaians. There is the free movement, which Ghana and Rwanda are already operating, which simply means that if you have, uh, 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 you're an African, you just need to come to uh, Ghana and you pick your visa at the airport. Let me just throw an idea, and I haven't come to the third point, let me just throw an idea of what we can do to, for example, accelerate our tourism and take an advantage. If I'm a Nigerian, I can come to Ghana without a visa from Rwanda, etc. Then why is it that if I'm from the UK, as an example, and I took a visa for Nigeria, I need a visa for Ghana? It's, if we can more than quadruple our tourism by simply saying that if you had a Nigerian visa, then you don't need a visa for Ghana. It's a very simple idea. But, but our, our public officials tend to play less on ideas and play more on the big picture. And I'm putting this new face right here. I can show him how to implement this idea and you can quadruple your tourism. It's not, it's not magic. So having said that, <clears throat> the free movement is already happening. Then we've got the third aspect, which is the free movement of goods and services. We tend to focus a lot on goods without services. So, for example, Exim should begin to think about how we, they will be supporting export of services. The yeah, law allows that, but I haven't seen much export of services. But let's talk about goods. The only way you can take advantage of, of the CFT, if it happens, is if your people start making mistakes now. We ought to make mistakes now. What do I mean by that? China is able to export today because in China you can get a spectrum of goods, one which is cheap and the one which is produced for the European market. Our people should be encouraged to make the mistakes now and perfect it so that by the time the CFT, only eight countries have signed. AU needs 22 countries to ratify. And the reason why we haven't reached the 22 is because of two key things, Nigeria and South Africa. South Africa has agreed to sign, remember, but Sri Ramaphosa is going to go for election. And when he finishes the election and he wins, he's going to accelerate. Buhari is going for election in April. If Nigeria wins, if he wins the election, he will sign. The rest will be history. What is going to happen is that if we don't start making the mistakes by encouraging small manufacturing people to add value now, by the time the 22 countries are rich, give me an estimate another three years, and when CFTA is in full, those who are taking advantage already now will be the ones who win. And who are they? Ethiopia and Djibouti. Why is that possible? Because China's Belt and Road Initiative has created a railway line that is connecting Ethiopia to Kenya, to Uganda, to Tanzania. The East Africa community is already fairly united. West Africa community, notwithstanding the passing of ETLS, has not functioned very well. So if we don't take care, when Mali and Senegal implement their Chinese $2.3 billion railway and they connect to East Africa, China, Ethiopia, which is now a basic manufacturer of value-added leather goods and the rest, will dump their goods here. So coming back to Exim, what we need to do, and I'll give you coconut as an example. Yes, I like Very coconuts. simple. <laughs> <laughs> we need... And, coconut can do always. Yes, and, and, and it's not the first time I'm saying this. I say this all the time, and somehow, it, uh, you have to keep repeating until they hear. And I'll just give you a live example. Today, I was happy, and somebody told me in the crowd, that UOP and everybody was talking about Ghana be center of the world. I've been preaching this for six years. It is the most important economic advantage we have because we are equidistant and we, are, we can be a hub for everything. And everybody talks about stability. Now they are talking about Ghana being the center of the world. We are. And we have to emphasize it more. But let me come back to coconut. And the point about coconut is that if we got our, our road sites, I have counted 1,000 coconut sellers on the roadside of Ghana. Yes, I, I, I have a research team that will collect data. 
I like that. I like that. I like that. Each of these 1,000 coconut sellers who are selling at 40 pesos are selling at 40 pesos today. They used to sell it at two pesos a few years ago, two pence a few years ago. How did they get to that? Because everybody started talking about coconut. But how do they sell the coconut? They take the cutlass, raw cutlass, eh, or machete. They cut the coconut, cut the, and then cut part of the husk of the coconut and turn it into the spoon for you. Actually, what we miss is that local investment is actually a best form of attraction for foreign investors. If our local investors who actually understand that if I funded the coconut bay and told them how to treat the coconut better and have simple plastic spoons and create fridges by the roadside and actually charge two pounds for the coconut now <laughs> and actually made the mistakes, one day somebody will look at how coconut can be exported fresh in, 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 in freezers that can get to Europe on time. We ought to make the mistakes now. But where we do not understand that simple coconut can be the trigger for investments, we will not remember that shito, which is unique to Ghana, and kelewele, which is unique to Ghana, yes. can be exported and made a brand worldwide, just like Chinese cuisine is a brand worldwide. Yes. And that's what we want to be thinking about. <laughs> so my point, my point for investors here is very simple, both local and foreign investors. Yes, there's oil and gas. I play in that space. Yes, there are all the big things. But actually, when it comes to continental free trade agreement, what will be very important are fast-moving, simple consumer goods. The coconut, which is four pounds, and the shito, which is just 50 pence, yeah. multiplied by 1.2 billion people. It's a huge market, including those in diaspora who cannot do without shito. That's a billion dollar business. That's what we should really be thinking about. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yes, um, I want to, who's got a question for either Clarence or Lauren? All that is being said, okay, and all that has been said has been laid down and thin. How effective is it? I've got clients who need just about $180,000, $1.2 million, and I've tell, I ask them, why haven't you gotten any money from any bank or any institution in Ghana? And it's the same thing, because you don't have any collateral. Okay, so, and like the gentleman David is saying there, if we get the local businesses to be working, because when foreign investors are coming, they want to be able to plug in. A collaboration will not work if the structures are not there for there to be a proper connection. Victor, I think you've been knocking on the wrong door. <laughs> so, tell your guys in Ghana to, to get in touch with us. Um, yeah, no, no, certainly, because you're right. I mean, we definitely play in, if you like, the small and medium sector space. And we also know that a lot of global organizations, I mean, about 70% of their revenue goes into supplies. So the supplier management bit is, is absolutely critical. So um, in terms of you know, what you're talking about, for example, if um, you're looking at some sort of $100,000, $200,000 sort of investment, our, our model um, allows us to, to even have dedicated consultants to just you know, help you even structure your proposal to be able to access credit. And um, you know, we also, I mean, I think it's important to also mention that most of the time when we talk about this access, access to finance, uh, when we have the access to finance conversation, the, you know, the immediate thing is to look at the supply side. But it's equally important to focus on the demand side, which is the readiness of the SME to also access the facility. Do you have um, you know, record keeping, bookkeeping in place, corporate governance, all of that. And that's an area where Invest in Africa is investing significantly to help SMEs make sure that, you know, de-risk them as much as possible, look at their, their proposals to make sure they're, they're bankable. And we, have, we now have about three banking partners um, to, to, to choose from, GCB, Barclays, um, and Ecobank are all partners, and I can tell you because they've been part of the process of de-risking these SMEs, they, they look at them a bit differently than you just walking into any other bank. I can tell you for a fact that first half of this year alone, eight out of ten proposals in, talk, in terms of dollar value that we put forward before the banks have been approved for our SMEs. That tells you the quality of SMEs we have and the bankability as well. So over time, what you're going to find, as long as they keep to the repayment schedule, suddenly we may even be you know, benefiting from more competitive rates than out there in the market. So that's the advantage you have with uh, an organization like Invest in Africa, where we look at this. We like to pride ourselves the same way, a one-stop shop for SME development. So like I said, 
happy uh, for you to put your guy in touch with me or meet me personally. We're going to help you on that. Yeah. Uh, I am a children's author and a poet. But my question today is about shea butter. Every cosmetic industry today add shea butter to their products because they know how effective it is. Shea butter tree, as you said, it grows wild. Have we thought about producing it? Have we thought about specifically growing these shea butter trees as we do to cocoa trees? I'm happy to extend that already. Those two have been selected and we are working on it. As we speak, even the ones that are there, we've not even taken full advantage of them. When they ripe, we lose almost about 50% of it because we don't have the technology even to pick it from the trees. Again, coupled with that is snake bites. So what Eisenbach is seeking to do now is to do what we call share butter, share empowerment program for the northern region. It's primarily being done by our, our women folks. They go there, we need to support them with basic tools like gloves, um, Wellington boots, for them to be able to go there. We work closely with Crop Research Institute, but that will be an upscale of what we are doing now. Now is to make sure we pick them, try to even use local mechanism by processing them into the shear, raw shear. In UK here, Body Shop is buying directly from Ghana. And these are the kind of collaboration and relationships that we want to have. Can Body Shop move further by putting a manufacturing plant in Ghana? to be able to even produce the shea butter and then export them to, And we don't mind having a relationship with a Ghanaian partner. As we speak, we have two key manufacturing companies we just signed or approved for R&R, which I've disbursed just last week, almost about, um, we disbursed almost about $2 million to R&R. Then we have Francisca, who is also into shea butter, Oasis. So we are now supporting, and these are the things that Eisenbach is doing in getting access to market in America. But to also answer your question on continental free trade, I don't want to skip that one. <laughs> and I'll come to the coconuts. <laughs> For your information, and the good news is that I don't know whether David is aware or Yofi is aware. Continental Free Trade will sit with Exim Bank in the export trade house in Ghana. So Ghana has positioned itself to be the headquarters for the Continental Free Trade. And that is information that, so we have reserved three floors already. The president is quite serious about it. Kwame Nkrumah started AU. And now Dan Kwakufado wants to have the Continental Free Trade. That will help us to take advantage of the 1.8. So already steps have been taken, and we are working to make sure that Ghana is well positioned. And all of this would have Exim Bank support. Overseas investments, as we speak, pharmaceuticals, the likes of NS Chemist, the likes of Entrance, are already, Tobinko, are already exporting into Nigeria, Mali. But we have supported Entrance to put up a warehouse in Burkina Faso to take care of the pharmaceuticals and supply. So Ghana is well positioned in taking, as we speak in December, Afriexim is organizing a trade fair in Egypt for the continental free trade. Exim Bank will be supporting some of our SMEs. We just came back from America on Agua. We supported the government. We've actually paid for the whole fair. As we sit here, we are supporting Yofi in organizing this. These are the things that we do behind the scenes in facilitating trade and making sure that we position Ghana. So the silent Exim Bank, which is only 18 months old, the task is quite Herculean, the responsibility is quite big. So all the nice things that David is saying, I can tell him that it is on, it is on the drawing board and we will make sure that by the time this government 
finish it eight years, we would have executed most of the things that you're talking about. I don't know whether you have this data, but other countries have actually tried to cultivate it. Okay. It, it hasn't worked. Shea butter and a, another plant called Alam Black Hair, which is actually used as input for products that are made by companies like Unilever, just grow in the world. And there are few countries that it grows in. So it is not a want of trying. They've tried to cultivate it. And we are just lucky. Alam Black Hair, for example, grows only in Ghana, Nigeria, and Tanzania. But having said that, the sweet thing about shea butter is that a $50 million plant of shea butter, after process, the waste product generates 7 megawatts of power. Whoa! Yes. Now, the entire north of Ghana consumes less than 20 megawatts of power. Two 50 million shea butter plants can supply the entire power in the north. Um, my question to Lawrence is that what is Exim Bank capitalized at? And are the interest rates prohibitive for small, medium enterprises? Or, or, or do you work on margins? And then I have another question, which either Yofi or David can answer, that do, what is the protection that you afford to foreign direct investors into Ghana? And is this written In into the constitution In of Ghana? No, but where? Which, which area? You said... Energy. Yeah, energy. In okay. particular, in, yeah, for okay. example. I'm, I'm sure the law covers the whole lot, but I'm talking of energy in particular. Okay. And do you have any, in, any exchange or credit uh, risk evaluation or protection for a dollar base? Because obviously any foreign direct investor will either bring in dollars or pounds or whatever into the country. Um, and do you have a vibrant stock exchange? Yes, Exim Bank has one of the lowest competitive rates in Ghana. As we speak, our dollar facility ranges between 5% to 12% per annum, which is the cheapest that you can get in the Ghanaian market. In terms of capitalization, we, by the act, receive inflows from non-oil imports every month, which is tax, we tax imports to be able to finance exports. So on the average, every month I receive almost about $4 million, which is what I used to be able to do my financing. And this one does not go to the consolidative. It just goes straight to Bank of Ghana, and then it comes to Exim Bank. Indeed, last year, um, the Ghana Stock Exchange was one of the best performing in the world, having returned 50% on the local currency and about 46% um, on dollar. Um, so it was a great performance. And I must also add that over the period, there have been times when the Ghana Stock Exchange has been the best performing in the world. This is about the fourth time in a year. So it is vibrant, although it's small. Then on the question of protections, yes, it, our constitution guarantees protection of foreign investors. Indeed, in the GIPC law, once you are invested in Ghana, you are considered um, the same way a local investor or a Ghanaian business will. But you are guaranteed repatriation of your profits and your principals um, without any inhibitions. So that's there. Now, incentives in the energy sector. What we've done in Ghana is that some, there are certain sectorial um, coverage. So if you are in the energy sector, then you actually get your licensing from um, the Energy Commission, and they decide what incentives you have. But once you invest more than 50 million in any part of any economy in Ghana, you can negotiate investors. We call it the strategic investor situation. You can actually negotiate some of your incentives. And various... Um, sectors of the economy have automatic exemptions on some of the things. For example, customs duty on equipment and raw material even into manufacturing, you are exempted from those. Um, but we are, like I said earlier, we are significantly reviewing um, our laws and seeing how best we can become more attractive as an investment destination. And the likelihood is that we will look at incentives schemes. But um, I, I will go back to Victor on this issue of having to see a minister. 
I'm not sure it's written anywhere in the laws of Ghana that if you want to do business, you have to see a minister. Indeed, it's the business people who insist. It's the business people who insist that they want to see a minister. I mean, somebody came to my office and we virtually guaranteed him that all he wanted to get his business started. The GIPC will handhold him to get it done. He insisted that he wanted to see the minister. And we kept asking, what for? And he says, oh, but if I don't see the minister, it won't happen. He said, but you don't need him. The minister is not going to do anything for you. What you need, we will do it for you. We've done half of it. It took a lot of convincing before he realized when he started getting things done, I said, oh, truly, I didn't need to meet a minister. And it's not written anywhere that you need to see a minister. I didn't, you said something that I thought was, um, I'm not making fun of you, but I thought it was a bit ridiculous. You are doing business of $100,000, and you want to see a minister before you can start. There are people, Ghanaians, doing million-dollar business who don't see anybody. But they get their businesses done. Uh, making a point, uh, following on from, I think, what Victor said, and the focus sometimes is a bit missing because Ghanaians in the diaspora want to go back and do things. Uh, they're not bringing million dollar investments. But in the discussions, uh, it sometimes feels as if they're missing in the conversation. And so um, addressing the issue that I think Clarence was talking about uh, small investors coming to see you. Even with that, when you go to the banks, getting your interest rates, even at the preferential rates, can be as high as 26%, which is quite challenging. So, uh, you know, what is there anything that can be done? Is there any conversations taking place about getting the banks? to look at interest rates to make it uh, more affordable? To begin with, I'm not a commercial bank. I am um, a development bank. But just to answer your question, the Vice President this morning talked about fiscal consolidation and macroeconomic stability. It is these things that will bring the rates down. Remember, the commercial banks go out there into the open market to pick up deposits. And this is what demand supply issue. So if you're taking fixed deposits from the markets that are trapped 90, and when I was in a commercial bank, I used to laugh. At one breadth of the coin, the customer is asking for a high yielding investment. At another breadth of the coin, he's asking for a lower interest rate. It has not worked like that. And because they deal with short-term deposits, and that's why there is crisis in the banking industry. So, in terms of interest rate, it's only when the government is doing well as it's doing now, it has come down from 33 to about 18. I haven't heard about 26. But it can only come down, as you remember, in the days of the President Kofor, where banks were chasing customers. It is when there's great growth competition, there's liquidity and solvency in the financial industry. Then the rates will come down. And also, the trickles of some of you, your remittances, when it comes to the economy, all of these goes to help the economy for interest rates to come down. Because we are social entrepreneurs, we invest in human, in human beings, human resources. I just want to find out if there is an opportunity in human resources in Ghana, because all I'm hearing is manufacturing production, manufacturing production. Madam, I, I think this morning I spoke clearly about education as an asset class that you, can, you, you, you should invest in. There are private providers of education even at the tertiary level. There are private nursing schools. There's even a private medical school. Um, and so these are all, you know, uh, social investments that are taking place. If you go to the northern part of Ghana, there is a lot of social investment um, going on. Um, there are private equity firms that are clearly for social investment that are operating there. So um, I, I think if you want some more information, you can come over and we should give you a whole lot that you can do. Uh, let me just add, I think one way to look at it 
to any in any economy is to look at where the economy is going, not where it is today. Yes. So if you look at the fact that one of the things happening in Ghana and in many African countries, urbanization. And urbanization by itself triggers a number of things. So you can look at what it is that the economy would need. For example, just the fact that there is tourism growth and this whole concept of urbanization and Ghana just having opened a new terminal and becoming an aviation hub in that region will require a situation where you train people who are tall guys, as an example. You have a situation where government has just launched the, the, the uh, free SHS program. What you should be looking at in 10 years from now, when you have a mass of additional 90,000 people coming out of the universities, what are the areas you need to start training them, I mean, in, 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 uh, training them to work in, in the area? Similarly, I just wanted to go back quickly to your question about, there was a question about interest rates. It's very important. I think we are, Yes, it used to be 36%. But if you look at what has been happening, Bank of Ghana has actually been reducing the monetary policy rate and maintaining it in the last two sessions, which means that the base rate is actually coming down. So it is coming down. Then it's important to mention that we are actually beginning to, the, the, the stages of a commodity market and also derivatives. All these are financial instruments which is likely to drive the interest rate down. So we should be looking at where we are going and not where we are. I think the discussion about SME development has tended towards the larger SMEs and not towards the smaller SMEs. And it's interesting to note that in Nigeria, 99.8% of SMEs employ just 1.4 people. So the challenge for the panel, the challenge for the audience is how do we create a balanced economy that's creating jobs at multiple levels. It means we've got to go back to the communities and look at how those things, those communities are developing and what those communities' strengths are. But I would be interested in your comments. Sure. Looking at the um, oil industry, which is more, it's a highly technical, it's got a high technical demand. We have the car industry, uh, the automotive industry, which has been uh, brought into Ghana. We have uh, other, you know, uh, infrastructure developments which are, you know, going across, I mean, <clears throat> the country. So Do we have a technical skill base or are we Got it. developing Got it. our youngsters to have a technical skill base to feed these industries? It's much more critical than even sending people to investors because we all can be managers. We need people who should do stuff. So a lot of technical support is going to the, um, what you call technical colleges. Um, they are being upgraded and they are being retooled to be able to produce people with technical skills. Um, even our curriculums and universities are changing to encourage that. Um, it, it may be good for you to know that there is an oil and gas um, academy set up in Takradi um, to train people to pick up um, yeah, some, some of the, uh, the skills needed in the oil and gas sector. There is, um, the government has refurbished what they call the hospitality school called HOTCAT. Um, it's got a new investor to train people for the hospitality, by training trainers for the hospitality industry. So all these things are happening um, at the same time. And, but they also provide uh, an opportunity for investors because there's a huge demand, like David said. There's a huge demand for it. There's a new airport. Uh, there are people that needed to do stuff. Um, oil and gas, there are people needed to do stuff. Um, the construction industry, there are people needed to do stuff. These are all opportunities for investment as well. But they are happening in tandem with them, um, opening up the economy. So. Um, just also to let you know what ESM is doing, um, we are very soon going to launch a product or a project called Grassroots Initiative Development, which is called GRID. With that, we are targeting Swami Kokompe artisans. We bring in people from India. Just a, a week ago, I signed an MOU with Czech Republic. So all these technical skills. In the garment industry, for instance, instead of taking Ghanaians to go and learn how to do cuttings, professional ones. What I'm discussing with the AGA, that's the Association of Governments, is for us to hire technical expertise from other Bangladesh, 
or from India to come into the factories to teach our people how to do the knitting so professionally. Then at a certain point in time, if we want to move into what Ethiopia has done in terms of industrial park in the garment industry, then we will take from so in terms of technical skills, apart from the curriculum, the educational one, on the working relationship, we are also working with other partners to make sure that we can hire in terms of consultancy for the people to come home and do it. The question about the lady who was asking about she wanting to come together to do something on social. Like you've already said, some nursing training schools were licensed privately. We do have only about five training schools for the nursing training. But the government went ahead to make sure private institutions also support. And some of these people over the years were the ones who were coming to UK to do care and others. When you go to the northern region, even in the share butter, we are looking for partners. It is majority driven by our women to be trained and empowered. So because it is these monies that they use in taking care of the kids who go to school. So if you want to come to Ghana, as David said, you need to know where you want to fit. And you also you need to talk to the right people. But we will encourage you to come. There are so many social interventions that if you come, I'm sure you'll be able to give jobs to people to do. Um, one key area, as the gentleman tried to ask, where lies the employment areas? Government, for instance, a small factory of an investment of, let's say, two million can actually employ about 1,000 workforce. And that's why SM Bank, if you bring any application to us, we want to ask you how many employment creation is in there in the business plan, what value addition, and these are the things that we're looking at. But if you talk about SME, maybe the definition of SME varies from one country to the other. An SME is SA in Malaysia. They become a local corporate in Ghana. So, if you're talking about SME, where we happen, at least for us, either it's a total assets or in terms of sales. And these two the determinants helps us to class, um, clarify them. Yeah. And we've been helping them to make sure at least employment generation is key. So, so for us that invest in Africa, speaking to the gentleman uh, from BAT, um, just like uh, Lawrence was saying, the definitions vary. So for, for our purposes, we've defined um, an S to be, first of all, one with a, you know, less of a turnover focus. Because you know, for us, number one is having a global growth-oriented mindset. We want SMEs who are not just interested in being fit to compete locally, but also fit to compete regionally and globally. These are the kind of people that can take advantage of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. So that's the first one. Then in terms of uh, the turnover threshold, that's just for, for ease of classification. Uh, we we'll look at anywhere between 100 to say $200,000 annually. That's what we consider an S. And then the medium is $250,000 plus. So as you can see, we do make room for your, your I'm sure your S, you know, whoever you're referring to is probably covered within that. That said, we still have a, a, a very solid relationship with the National Board for Small Scale Industries. They tend to focus more of you like at the, at the front end, you know, micro level, startup level, and we have a good arrangement with them where probably they start off and then they pass on to us and then we take them further. And it's important to understand, you know, understand uh, as well that we believe in not just uh, keeping them where they are when they join, because I think the real proof of our model is being able to take an S and then invest, build their capacity so that they in turn can also become bigger and probably even subcontract. You know, one, one initiative we are currently working on is what we call the homegrown buyers. And uh, as you know, the, you know, Invest in Africa has this Africa Partner Pool, which is an online marketplace where we connect buyers to 1,500 suppliers. And our goal now is to say, look, there, we've identified about 50 of these 
suppliers who have the potential to become buyers themselves. These are entry-level buyers, but they're all indigenous, Ghanaian companies. And what we are now doing is, is to invest in them, you know, in terms of their supply chain, their procurement capabilities, providing strategic marketing support, so that these guys can now play that role as buyers and also subcontract opportunities uh, to smaller SMEs on, on, on the pool. And then we keep the cycle going. So you start off as S, you move into an M, and possibly even large. So we're constantly developing across the value chain at each point in the supply chain. So, so David, I mean, if you look at, um, you know, Guinness, for example, who's one of our partners, Guinness, as you know, has a very strong local raw material uh, sourcing um, agenda. They, they started with about, their, their goal is to get to about 70% of their raw materials being sourced locally. Started with about 12% in 2012. Today they are at about 50%. Working through 25,000 farmers in the north, not just uh, in Accra, but in the north. And, uh, in, and, and by the way, this is where it gets into a bit of a local content conversation. And the key thing there is that it's not just about an alternative supply source which is inferior, but all these 25,000 farmers are feeding into a supply chain that has been validated and vetted on, on the basis of competitiveness of pricing, of, of, uh, of value, of ability to, be, you know, to reliably supply uh, the off-taker. So all of that is taken into account to building these guys into solid entrepreneurs and enterprises that can go on to play on a bigger scale. So yes, we do cover that, that gamut, and uh, you know, happy to discuss one-on-one -on -one if there's a more specific question. Thank you so, so much, my esteemed panel, for literally giving us a masterclass on how to invest in Ghana. A round of applause.